Well, welcome to our public talk. Well done for those of you who um, recognise that the usual Friday talk is a Wednesday talk um, this week, although we have a Friday concert as well. But um, welcome, and I'm very pleased that we um, are able um, to have Professor David Goodman here to speak to us. Um, it can't be Friday because he's going to be in the House of Lords on Friday doing exciting things, which I've just heard about, which is why he's over. But um, he is a professor at Boston College, and when the visiting students at Mansfield from Boston College heard that he would be over in the country, they wrote to me and said, you have to have um, Professor Goodman to speak. He's going to be brilliant. And um, what he was going to say sounded very, very exciting. So we're honored to have Professor Goodman here. He's the Associate Dean for Strategic Initiative and External Relations um, and an Associate uh, Professor of the Practice of Counseling, uh, Development and Educational Psychology um, in the um, School of Education at Boston College. And we very much value our links with Boston College. And his talk today um, really couldn't be more uh, timely um, because he's going to be talking about the streaming self, the joining effects of technology and liberalism. And I hope he's going to say something um, uplifting because this is uh, an area that causes me some anxiety, but maybe he won't, who knows. Anyway, he will be taking questions after the talk, so um, I'm very good, pleased to invite you here, David. Thank you very much for making time for us. Thank you. I had not been forewarned that this needed to be uplifting, <laughs> so it has me slightly anxious. Um, but thank you so much, Helen, for inviting me here, and to Sophia and Michael for vouching for me and um, speaking as you did about my work. Uh, it's just such a delight to be here in front of you today. Thank you for making your Friday a Wednesday instead uh, to be here. And uh, as I got to know this public talk uh, in preparation for this and looked back at the history of this, I just can't tell you how incredible it is that this is a community that values bringing in the types of voices that you are bringing in across so many different critical sectors of, of human civilization right now and that you as a community are working with these critical issues. I, I'm inspired by that and feel very honored to be able to be a part of it in this way. So thank you. So what you're going to see tonight is a psychologist who is struggling with some very big questions. I'm inviting you into some of these struggles to help me understand some of the phenomena that we are all experiencing in this world that we are currently living in. So join me with some of these half-baked ideas. I look forward to rich conversation and meaningful exploration together. It is not cinched together tight, but the pieces are here, I hope, for us to play with. I assert that there are quite dangerous risks, both individual and political, to the ways that the self is being configured through the combined effects of technologically mediated social relations and the exigencies of living in a modern liberal political state. In our short time together, I'm hoping to paint a bit of a picture for you to consider. Now, I will say from the start, I am concerned that I might sound like a Luddite, a technology naysayer, and I am truly not. I don't hold that technology will get us into trouble. I'm contending that we will get ourselves into trouble in our technology use. Now, the difference here, requiring a whole talk of its own, is that I worry less about technology and more about the human user's need as they use technology. What is their libidinal loading, their desire and need set, based on the many factors that make us up, going into how they relate to their cell phones, Instagram, Facebook, and texting? I don't worry about candy bars. I worry about a fast-paced culture, poor self-regulation, management of emotions through quick fixes, and a range of other influences that make the candy bar irresistible and detrimental to me. One candy bar is not going to cause me harm. But what is my relationship with that candy bar? Why am I eating it? What if I am malnourished and ravenous all the time? Therein lies the risk, my way of relating to the bar, not the bar itself. So we'll come back to this, I promise. Similarly, I don't believe that liberalism is doomed in a bad system. It might be the very best we have, but it is fraught, and we must contend with it. I know this is an odd way to start a talk and not uplifting from the start, uh, but it's important that I provide this clarity from the start because I'm not anti-technology, I'm not anti-liberalism. I think we need a better capacity of being critical of both in order to ensure they can actualize good things 
and not problematic results. So let me introduce to you a friend of mine, a very interesting Lithuanian philosopher of the 20th century, Emmanuel Levinas. I wish I could spend some of my time, most of my time, all of my time acquainting you with his incredibly important ideas. But knowing I only have a short moment with you, I'm gonna give you a quick splash and then I'll do so, uh, then I'll, and I'll do so by evoking one of Levinas's frequently conjured Greek myths, that of the Gyges ring. So go ahead and follow me on this journey. There's gonna be a lot of twists and turns. Uh, from er as early as Herodotus, often represented as the fir first Greek historian, we have accounts of this telling of the Gyges myth. It is a myth retold in many forms throughout Western history. Some actually argue that Tolkien's Lord of the Rings is actually inspired by this. He denies that vehemently. But once you hear what it is, you might understand why. So, in Plato's Republic, his version of the telling of this story goes as this, goes like this. You have a, a shepherd, Gyges, living in the, the town of Lydia, and he's out in the, in the field with his flock, and a huge thunderstorm comes through. And as it comes through, there's also a huge earthquake, this sort of epic thing, the, the ground cracks open, and he looks into the crevasse, and he sees this major, this sarcophagus, this huge body, larger than life, and the only thing on it is a gold ring. And so he reaches in, takes this gold ring, puts it on, and walks away from the scene. Later on in the day, he returns to this sort of circle of shepherds as they're debriefing the day, giving an account of what's taken place. And he's got the ring on his finger, and as they're all sitting around the campfire, he turns the collet of the ring inward, just sort of as he's fiddling with it. And all of a sudden, the other shepherd starts speaking as though he's not there. Turns the collet outward, and they see him again. So, of course, he quickly discovers that this ring gives him the power of invisibility. So he does what anyone would do with a new power of invisibility. He finds a way to join the envoy of the king, seduces the queen's wife, puts hands on the king, kills the king, and becomes the ru ruler of Libya, right? That's what you would do if you got a gold ring. That's just the way it works. Um, so that is the short of this story. Now, Levinas frequently uses this myth and its presence in a variety of Greek sources to point to a core valuation of invisibility, non-exposure, and invulnerability in the Western philosophical corpus and what he would describe as the, quote, European subjectivity that spawned from these ancestors. According to Levinas, the story of Western philosophy, as early as the pre-Socratics and increasingly pronounced after Descartes, is a tale privileging being, knowledge, rationality, existence, and the sovereignty of the constituting ego. For Levinas, the Gyges myth is a story that represents a self able to constitute its surroundings, make the world visible to itself through its rational faculties, while remaining impervious to the gaze of others. The psyche reaches out and possesses experience without being called upon or possessed in the process. The rational person sees things as they are without having any necessary claim on their identity. In other words, Levinas uses this narrative as an example of perceiving, experiencing, and constituting others without the need of being present, responsible, and vulnerable to any other. In his book, A Secular Age, Charles Taylor refers to this self as a, quote, buffered self, one that sees itself as invulnerable, as master of the meaning of things. He goes on to further describe it as a version of the self wherein, quote, the possibility exists of taking a distance from, disengaging from everything else outside the mind, end quote. The Gygean buffered self is able to be invisible and uses this ability to maintain a protected, more sovereign disposition. Levinas suggested this Gyjian way of being is, quote, the very condition of man, the possibility of injustice and radical egoism, the possibility of accepting the rules of the game, but cheating. In Totality and Infinity, Levinas's first most recognized philosophical work, he refers to this protected Gyjian distance and immunity to the other as living with windows closed and doors shut. You see, as a Holocaust survivor who lost the majority of his family to Nazi coll collaborators in Lithuania, he links the power to possess and control one's vulnerability to those sorts of reductive processes that ultimately lead to violence done to the other. Achieving distance and modulating access to oneself through the formation of mediating concepts, representations, and categorizations is a first step 
to the capacity to dehumanize and reduce the other to simpler and more manageable forms. The other, in such a form, loses her ability to disrupt, disturb, and interrupt me, making ethics no longer possible. And for Levinas, an allergy to the other is partly derived from the repudiation of vulnerability, visibility, and exposure that he would say is implicit in the moral systems of Western ideologies by and large. The invisibility of the self in Levinas's work is the beginning of violence. Levinas at his core is concerned about the ways that we construct realities and definitions of who we are that create ethical distances between persons. Okay, so that's how we're starting. And now let's get into a bit of the argument for the day. I hope you're, hope you're still following with me. In 1969, during one of his Talmudic lessons given at the annual colloquium of Jewish intellectuals in Paris, Levinas takes the opportunity to do something quite unusual. He critiques the cafe culture of Paris, which I actually sort of enjoy. Here's what he says. It is an open house on street level, a place of facile society without reciprocal responsibility. You enter without necessity. You sit without fatigue. You drink without thirst. The cafe is not a place. It is a non-place for a non-society. For a society without solidarity, without common interests, a game society. The cafe, a house of games, is the point through which the game penetrates into life and dissolves it. A society without yesterday and without tomorrow, without responsibility, without seriousness, a distraction, a dissolution. In essence, Levinas views the Parisian cafe as a place where the body, culture, human bonds, history, the elemental, you'll hear me use this word a lot this evening, the elemental, vulnerability and exposure are ignored. No serious needs are expressed or in play. Vincent van Gogh's 1888 Cafe Terrace at Night depicts a timeless scene of contentment, leisure, and anonymity. The characters move into the open air seating without fatigue, absent hunger, free of urgency or responsibility. It's where we are temporarily dislocated to relieve ourselves of the gravity of the temporal. The cafe is a non-place where we are unlinked from the fullness of our condition. In this lecture, I invite us to actually think together about this, but with our technologically mediated relations in mind, not the cafe or the pub. I argue that the dominance of digital exchange in liberal societies is simultaneously an outgrowth and reinforcement of the cafe culture of which Levinas was so critical. This is simultaneously an outgrowth and a reinforcement both of those things. The virtual becomes our new non-place for a non-society. In the world of digitally refereed connection, the house of games most certainly penetrates into life and our daily experience. Here I hope to consider with you the possibility that it indeed contributes to the dis dissolving of the human bond and a certain type of ethical potentiality within the liberal political environment. More frightening even, I'll connect this to the liberal subject's attraction to vitalist, nationalist, and militaristic solutions within fascism. I'll come to this quote in just a second. There's a huge amount that I have to skip over about Levinas's thought. Ultimately, he is known for a radical ethics wherein I am inexhaustibly responsible to the other who cannot ever be reduced. Many of his ideas are derived from a careful and intensive reading of Husserl and Heidegger, and I feel badly I can't walk us through a lot of that to sufficiently lay the foundation for the talk tonight. But what I will take up, where I will take it up, is simply by saying that Levinas is speaking directly to the ethical impoverishment of humanism and the liberal state. Levinas says, as you see here, we must ask ourselves if liberalism is all we need to achieve an authentic dignity for the human subject. Levinas brings us this question in a way that I think is especially relevant to the present moment because in the background of his work is the haunting and daunting query, why is the liberal subject attracted to fascism? So let me break this open a little further. One of Levinas's earliest works is Reflections on the Philosophy of Hitlerism, which he actually published in 1934, the very year that Hitler gained, seized full dictatorial power in Germany. In this short essay, Levinas explicates the failure of liberalism. 
Simon Critchley, a Levinas scholar, states, quote, for Levinas, liberalism is the political corollary of idealism. I liberalism takes idealism's idea of the subject and makes it a political subject of rights. I am a subject in the world with rights, and I can choose this or that, end quote. For Levinas, liberalism is dangerous in the distances it creates between myself and others through mediating abstractions and concepts, human rights, equality, and inalienable endowments, even thinking about humanity more generally. A right to exist and have will in this world is often the starting point from which an ethic emerges in the liberal order. Though in seeking to equalize and promote a version of liberty available to all, the byproduct of the liberal state is a type of unlinking from bodies and communities. There is a depletion of ethical subjectivity when ethics becomes defined by socially contracted agreement about how we are to see and live in the world. In a liberal state, I do not murder because thou shalt not murder is a shared agreement that emerges from a consensual definition of human life and rights that ultimately promotes a safer life for all of us. You generally are just as much a human being as myself and thus deserve to receive the same rights as I do. That sounds quite benign, right? However, this is quite different than experiencing your corporeality as vulnerable and is addressing me with, please, do not kill me. For Levinas, the former requires ethics to be mediated by ontology and abstract concepts. And this mediated ethics, again, is a depleted ethics for Levinas. Levinas's central concern is that ethics be first philosophy, as he calls it, which requires that it emerges from embodiment, livedness, facticity, and encounter the face of the other and the address that comes from the other. Once ethics ceases to be proximal, the forgetfulness and sleepiness of egoism creeps in, not to mention the bureaucratic mechanisms that remove from me the other's need. Abstractions, theoreticism, and intellectualism are protective gear. The liberal subject ascribes to a form of theoretical, ethical sensibility whereby human rights are to be upheld equality and liberty to be maintained and freedoms protected. A form of idealism governs the formation of governmental structuring and human relations. It is a distant and non-sensual ethics, an ethics with little vitalism. It is an ethics that has little face to face. It is a form with little materiality. Hunger is not known in a visceral way. Judith Butler captures something of this in the following quote. We have an interesting political predicament. Most of the time when we hear rights, we understand them as pertaining to individuals. When we argue for protection against discrimination, we argue as a group or a class. And in that language and in that context, we have to present ourselves as bounded beings, distinct, recognizable, delineated subjects before the law, a community defined by some shared characteristic features, excuse me. Indeed, we must be able to use the language to secure legal protections and entitlements but perhaps we mis make a mistake if we take the definitions of who we are legally to be adequate de descriptions of what we are about. Although this language may well establish our legitimacy within a legal framework ensconced in liberal versions of human ontology, it does not do justice to passion and grief and rage, all of which tear us from ourselves, bind us to others, transport us, undo us, implicate us in the lives that are not our own irreversibly if not fatally. Throwing another long quote at you. Philip Reif observed that de Tocqueville, John Stuart Mill, and others worried about what would happen to public life once individualism had sapped its virtues. <coughs> For the individual would no longer feel committed to the chain of all the members of the community. Democracy, de Tocqueville concluded, breaks that chain and severs every link of it. The individual is thus, in de Tocqueville's grand diagnosis, the defaulted citizen. He has cut off his feelings from communal affection. Individuals learn to feel that they owe nothing to any man, and they expect nothing from any man. They acquire the habit of always considering themselves as standing alone, and they are apt to imagine that their whole destiny is in their own hands. In a highly differentiated democratic culture, truly and for the first time, there arose the possibility of every man standing for himself, each 
at last leading a truly private life, trained to understand rather than love or hate his neighbor. This privatized and atomized subject is not doing so well. It is an alienated and unlinked being. Emile Durkheim and many others have written about the form of anomie that is an ongoing risk for the liberal subject and something quite endemic in the late 20th century and early 21st century. As a clinical psychologist, I can tell you that the level of psychological distress being faced in the United States is tremendous and rising. Studies are showing that our mental health delivery systems are simply falling apart as they are well beyond their capacity. So much more can be said about this, of course, in a whole other talk. But this takes us to our next point and to Levinas's question about why fascism attracts the liberal subject. Fascism and nationalism reconnect reason, nature, and the body, and the social. The fastest route to this reconnection is through bloodline and nativism, which are immediately enticing and available. Levinas was witness to the manner with which fascism becomes the populace's response to the unfolding of liberal subjectivity and its anemia. During his time, Levinas watched as liberalism was decisively defeated with the advent of Hitlerism. But why? What does Hitlerism have that liberalism doesn't? Or more broadly, what does fascism, nativism, and nationalism have that liberalism doesn't? One simplification of the argument here is that liberalism places tenants and mediators between its subjects, creating a libidinal break that leaves them disconnected and unlinked from one another. Vitality leaves and dead ends in the individual, where it tangles and distorts. Fascism promises to relink and restore the libidinal flow, creating a type of vitalism through these elemental connections. Simon Critchley again here, quote, Hitlerism elicits a political and metaphysical structure that celebrates our being attached to ourselves, celebrates our being riveted to ourselves, end quote which by the way, Levinas describes as barbaric. But Levinas understands that it holds the elemental and enrooted qualities that make the subject, that, excuse me, that take the subject from the abstract, intellectual, and detached back to a form of elemental to which he's actually sympathetic and even emphasizes in his own work. Critchley sums this up well in the following quote. This is the point. Fascism is onto something deep and liberalism is screwed. Fascism touches something elemental about us and who we are, and it has to be transformed. That's Levinas's project. This all leads to an interesting conclusion. National socialism is right in its basic intention. It's right in its critique of a disembodied liberalism. What it sees is something obscured by liberalism. It sees the elemental and rootedness of the human being. National socialism is a philosophy of the elemental. Levinas sees, end quote, Levinas sees the liberal state as contributing to social and ethical fragmentation and unlinking and seeks to develop a type of alternative elemental philosophy. I have to be really clear here. Fascism, nativism, and nationalism as the resolution or alternative to liberalism is an ultimately violent enchainment in the egotistical and tragic finitude. Those are Levinas's words. And Levinas does, he spends the rest of his career actually trying to describe this in, in detail um, in, in his philosophical writings. He does not ascribe to them, but rather knows that we have to develop a philosophy and political arrangement that takes the elemental seriously. Levinas's philosophy is one that recognizes a vitalism of the subject, but not vitalism for authenticity's sake or as some telos or rational order. Rather, we are hungry and live as bodies that pulsate and replenish and grow. He sees ethics as first emergent from this place of hungry bodies. So let's move now to the next object of our inquiry here, the manner by which liberal communal social political realities and technologically mediated relations promote the very characteristics that Levinas feared would deform our subjectivity. Wilfred Bion, a brilliant British psychoanalyst, 
provides us with a theory on linking and thought that will allow us the next step in the argument. Working primarily with the experience of psychosis and persons struggling with personality disorders, Bion shows us that thinking is concerned with linking. Thought is the ongoing linking of language, emotion, memory, reason, and images. These, these all link together and piece together to become your stream of subjectivity. What happens, however, when thought is too threatening? What happens when trauma makes it so that the flow of thought is excruciating and truly intolerable and not survivable? As very adaptive beings, there's a mechanism that allows a type of unlinking of the thought process, a disruption of the flow that Beyond describes as an attack on linking, an attack on thought itself. And it facilitates a being's survival. Now, of course, at a cost. The image of combining extension cords that conduct electricity is helpful here. When the flow of electricity is appropriate to the cord's voltage capacity, then energy is allowed to flow through it. When the voltage exceeds the capacity, the disconnection of the cords and disruption of the flow is the only way to cut the destructive surge. This depiction provides one way of understanding the function of depression, psychosis, and even anxiety. Halting the full flow of thought through mood disruption Cognitive interruptions, memory loss, concentration difficulties, etc., disorganization of mental state, and even the breaking of our relationship to reality can actually be a creative means of pulling the cords apart and protecting the mind from destruction. Our psyches are powerful in their ad adaptivity in this way, and it often is a very helpful way of, of thinking about what psychopathology is, is this adaptive function of our mind, this pulling apart of extension cords lest something becomes so much that it would destroy us. Now, as stated before, beyond scholarship in this area remained primarily within the context of differing forms of psychosis and personality disorders. But more recently, beyond theories have been brought into the social and political spheres by the psychoanalyst Lynn Layton in her work around unlinking and psychic splitting in liberal contexts. For Leighton, the result of the pressures of hyper-individualistic, hyper-competitive, neoliberal society has resulted in the involuntary adoption of what she terms normative unconscious processes, which work to uphold dominant ideologies, even at the cost of much psychic pain, to secure the love of intimates and the approval of one's social world, end quote. And we all need the approval of one's social world for survival's sake. That's a very basic need, belonging. The ideologies Leighton explores in this regard revolve around long-standing power differentials related to class, race, gender, and sexuality. This unconscious appropriation for Leighton has not only worked to uphold the dominant norms, but has effectively split the public from the private, the social from the individual, and male from female. <coughs> the result of this is what Leighton terms unlinking or psychic splitting which is a process that consists of individuals disassociating from or splitting off from themselves those characteristics or aspects that are deemed to be threatening or not supportive of the overall ability to survive and receive love. Leighton reasons that as dominant traits such as independence, rationality, agency, and productivity are championed, more traditionally feminine characteristics such as dependency, vulnerability, and empathy are unconsciously deemed as unsafe ways of being and relating in the world. It is beyond the scope of this time to discuss the various purposes that such unlinking processes produce societally, but the burgeoning literature on neoliberalism provides a very helpful landscape for this discussion, not one that I can take up here. So bringing together Levinas's concern with the ideas put forth from Bion and Leighton and others, I hope to accentuate the risks that emerge from the liberal subject being unlinked losing its proximity and vital charge, and then pursuing elemental reconnections through technological entanglements. A subject that is caught, has become caught in a new society that is a non-place. So let's turn our attention to that next. I had the incredible fortune of having lunch with Julia Kristeva, which was amazing, peak experience in life. Um, and during this, she actually, she, we were talking about technology and she said to me, that she had this sort of idea of the self as a sort of streaming subjectivity. And what she was speaking to in this descriptive phrase is her conceptualization of the flow 
of identity in a technologically saturated and mediated world. In a post-traditional world where youth are primarily linked to one another and to information and experience via social media and devices, she describes a shift from interiority with a complex web of symbolism and narrative complexity, along with a sense of one's continuity, to a selfhood instead that streams. I want to consider several implications of Kristeva's description in connection to some of the concepts we've already gone over. First, with rapidly shifting flow of information and interactions, the hyperlinked subject is anything but linked. If anything, it can easily be brought into the social, um, excuse me, If anything, it can easily be conceptualized as a type of, of unlinking, an attack on linking and thought. The capacity to sustain attention itself is significantly diminished with this streaming subjectivity. Without rigorous and sustained attention, the elemental and sensate link to the other recedes. Sherry Turkle from MIT and a very interesting scholar on technology and social relations describes the upcoming generation as decreasingly capable of even reading a novel due to their shortened attention spans. Even conversation is an art lost to the many links that now comprise our express communication, texts, instant messages, and so forth. We move along in these short bursts of information and exchanges. The narrative within which one resides is just a swipe away on a screen. You can move that quickly between the different narratives. The rapidness of stimulus change shifting frames of reference and the saturation of information and range of accessibility is perhaps a form of attack on the maintenance of a structured linking of thought process. One byproduct of this hyperlinked and thus unlinked streaming subject is that current stimulus is often one of the primary determinants of thoughts and feelings. There is a, a shallowness to the movement of thought and it is not grounded in the complex repository of previous self and communal identifications. An interiority richly furnished, as Foucault describes it, with shared metaphors, ideological anchors, and experiential depth gives way to self-state shifts and multiplicity of identifications. The symbolic is thinned into momentary episodes of sociocultural activity with little relationship to significant and long-standing religious or cultural symbols. Instead of being structured and upheld by religious cultural pylons driven deep into a bedrock of shared meaning, identity is now better understood as floating on the surface of tumultuous waters. As just one effect of this, Kristeva cites the profound effect of negative peer appraisals, appraisals on Instagram or elsewhere that have contributed to increased suicidality among youth. The capacity for internal validation or substantial community touch points has given way to a need to you know, check in on Facebook and post pictures of all meals to Instagram in order for food to be fully enjoyed. The amount of likes to a post has become, in essence, a new, if distant, way of receiving love. Even one's own experience of realness and experiential registry is linked to digital visibility and exhibition. I, I think about a time I was with a student there's a, a part of Massachusetts where I live uh, called Rockport, and it's right on the coast. It's beautiful, you know, these huge stones, and the water's always uh, coming up against it and throwing spray everywhere. And there was a group of us there, and we're all just taking it in as, as the water is surging up the sides of the rocks. And I look over, and she's holding her camera out, and I hear her whisper, come on, do something interesting. And she has to capture this moment in her phone and post it in order somehow for it to register as a lived experience. So the, the, the very nature of where experience goes, how it lodges, how it is metabolized is, is being transformed is part of what I'm trying to communicate here. Cultural symbols are hashtags with a short shelf life. They swarm around viral and trending moments, but the symbolism burns bright and is short lived. It's a type of symbolic that streams from fragmentary libidinal charges, discharges. The deep aquifers behind these human experiences, values, and needs are unlinked from the libidinal containers once present in communal sources and traditions. 
Chris Davis speaks about the artistic and biblical illiteracy that she frequently <coughs> witnesses. There is a type of unlinking from the source and eschewing of longstanding tradition. This is emblematic of loss of attention at the cultural le level even, which contributes to a superficial subjectivity driven by sparks of libidinal charge, which by the way are capitalized upon, mined, and literally bought by social media companies. If you watch the movie, The Social Dilemma, you'll see this depicted, yes, that your very attention is actually being mined by these capital-based agencies. Next, from a Bionian or Beyond's perspective and with Leighton's application in mind, I wonder if hyperlinking in its concomitant shallowing of, inter of interiority and sustained experiential depth is actually an adaptive way of managing the too muchness of the political situation and the weight that it presses on the individual who is without the resources and moral community to create meaning. Counterintuitively, it is a means of reducing one's experience of vulnerability and exposure. That is, alongside this social technological development is the rise of globalized exposure to the needs and suffering of peoples around the world. Now more than ever, individuals are inundated with news stories revealing poverty, anguish, death, and corruption. While this level of reporting and awareness to concerns worldwide is important, it simply exceeds individual capacity to adequately attend or even make meaning of what's being witnessed. So maybe you gotta pull apart the extension cords, right? A part of the sheer overwhelm is, as Leighton reminds, the fundamental lack of containers and social safety nets that provide enough security to allow for open and attentive ongoing awareness. When one aligns the cultural compulsion to be plugged in with this inundation of somber and disquieting news stories, the perceived necessity of frequent, brief, moderately superficial bursts of communication that are attention reducing actually makes a lot of sense. It's clear, it is adaptive, it is functioning to soothe and disconnect before the surge is too great. But unfortunately, this adaptive move of the subject has resulted in an unlinking from a capacity for deep personal connectivity and the ability to sit in perceived vulnerability without methods of relief. I can now scroll past news stories about the devastation in the Ukraine to watch pictures and videos of adorable cats playing pianos. And I can argue with people online knowing that all I have to do is shut my computer and the conversation is over. So coming full circle to Levinas's political concerns, this vivid depiction of streaming subjectivity that Chris David gives us highlights the risk of being without a serious and elemental place for identity to take shape and ambulate. A counterfeit elementalism begins to develop in our new cloud-based communal political reality. All of us connected up and tethered into this together. It is a situation wherein makeshift links are contrived in order to experience vitalism and connectedness. There is indeed a type of libidinal flow that gratifies and stirs in technological exchange, no question. But what is dangerous about living in a non-place is the way that libidinal and elemental fundamentals are not given the wattage that they need. Or better said, they are not given the form true to their nature. They are approximations and thus leave remainders, ghosts, traces, and something unmet. Pornography is not the same as intimate relationship with a living, breathing lover. Furthermore, if unlinking simply meant relief, a trauma no longer experienced or a thought sequence no longer conjuring annihilation, then the story would have a possibility of a positive ending. It's adaptive, right? But what we know from beyond the trauma literature, intergenerational transmission scholarship, and so forth, is that the unlinked always seeks to relink, but often through moder uh, uh, modified and distorted forms. Direct links may not be possible due to the degree of overwhelm, but this does not leave the charge somehow in your view. If anything, it picks up more perverse and fetishizing ways of seeking to be relinked. Trauma simultaneously avoids and seeks to be retouched, reconnected with, seen, and engaged. The psychoanalytic representation of repetition compulsion is a powerful example of this enigmatic tangle of energy. Similarly, an unlinked society seeks to relink through perverse and pornographic means. 
the loss of the communal leaves a variety of pseudo communities as substitutes, communities that are insufficient to hold in the libidinal flow. We didn't have the electrical uh, circuitry in place to manage the libidinal energies of Occupy Wall Street. It came and left. They blew the circuit and it dispelled. This is partly what leaves a liberal democratic society, especially susceptible to fascism, neo-fascism, and various <coughs> versions of elementalisms. The alienation and disconnection engendered by competitive free market economic structures, rights oriented around the allegedly equalizing pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness, and the valorization of the individual and her self-constitution are born from a liberal idealism with its distancing ethics that forget human hunger and blood. The slowly generated anomie, alienation, and desensitization in invoked by Eric Fromm, Durkheim, Hannah Arendt, and many others point to the effects of this unlinking. Commonly, this translates into societal enticements to relink through contrived and pseudo-communal experiences. It is a search for vitalism and the elemental, but it often takes the shape of vicarious practices, such as electing a president who promises to be vicious, narcissistic, impulsive, and a childish man. Not sure who I might be talking about as I say that. Right? We, we were performing something of seeking a type of libidinal charge in, in electing a person like that. Um, tracking the Jersey Shore characters, another example. These dramas, if you will, these spectacles, create a type of fascination that allows some flow of libidinal juices. But fascination, <coughs> this is a concept I really enjoy, fascination, according to theologian Kevin Hart, is the ugly cousin of contemplation and actual thought. Fascination is, he would say, unlinked imagination caught in its own desire to gorge on experience. One of the things Kevin Hart describes as he's, as he's walking through this concept is he studied, I believe it was 13th century um, contemplative communities and what they would do in terms of their practices to develop, develop the, the, the abilities to open themselves up to that which is greater than themselves, engaging contemplative practices that facilitated the muscle development, if you will, of being available to the world and to God and to what was in front of oneself. And that, that took rigorous practice. And he says, the flip side of that, the passive mind is a mind that constantly seeks to be fascinated, to, to just gorge on, binge on experience. So he says, you know, when you pass a car accident, for instance, people leer at it. They, 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 they can't help but be fascinated by what took place, this gnarling of, of, of things, right? Keeping up with the Kardashians would be a great example of, you know, no one would say this is a nourishing, meaningful way to spend one's time, but it is a place to gorge, right? It is a place to, to leer and to be fascinated by how do humans become this? What is this thing that they live? So forth and so on. Fascination is a consumptive mental state as opposed to an open mental state that contemplation might be. Now Hart reflects on this and says that this is one profile of our modernity, the triumph of fascination over contemplation. Almost there. <laughs> in the United States and much of Europe, we are residing in a highly liberal context with the many risks that Levinas articulates. Indeed, every political configuration maintains a, a particular form of libidinal flow and investment. There's no such thing as a governmental or political system that doesn't sort of divert libidinal energies in one way or another. But for Levinas, he's particularly concerned with the ways that the abstract notions of human rights, individual liberties, and a common good do not allow for the affective and vital connection. It is a form of government that has forgotten the ways <coughs> that we are riveted to our bodies, to our blood, and to the conductance of interpersonal desire. Add to this a platform of exchange such that we see with the new dominance of technological environments and one witnesses the liberal subject at full risk of libidinal hijack through unlinking and the subsequent counterfeit mediums it uses to relink. There is a semblance of, of linking online, of course, but in actuality, there is tremendous acceleration of the unlinking of thought and persons. 
It is a cultivation of non-thought and fascination rather than a form of subjectivity derived from visceral proximity, embodied ethics, and contemplation-based justice. These are the mechanisms by which fascism and neo-fascism defeat or overwhelm liberalism. So my question to all of us is, how might we construct a place where fatigue, hunger, thirst, and responsibility are given serious play in how we develop our systems of being in this world together? Thank you. sober talk. Um, I, I am interested in the, in the way that you have described that tech draws on our, our hungers and almost urges to find out and to be connected in a way that ends up alienating us. And I guess I wanted to throw back to you the question you ended with. Are there ways that you think as a psychologist that tech can be used to help us develop the authentic and enduring and genuine link that perhaps so many people are seeking and then being left hungry and forged at the same time? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and again, I'm, I'm not an anti-technology person, which means that I um, I think technology is, is, is the candy bar in the sense that it does not have to be problematic. And, and there are even some candy bars these days that you know have some good protein in them. Um, I really fear that any any type of any use of something that's going to mediate human relations, if we are all living in a, a place where we're ravenous, libidinally gnarled states, is not going to lead to good things as we use technology. I mean, when we use, I mean, any tool we pick up when we're in an unhealthy state is not going to be used in a healthy way. Um, but I, I don't think that technology has to be that. I think there's a lot of technologies that can, I mean, I think about people that wouldn't be able to see family without this, right? But those links are already there. The, the thick relation is already there. The visceral proximal sort of animates behind the digital then, the virtual. Mm -hmm. um, what I fear is much more the sort of digital native next generation that much of their connection is brokered from within the technological systems, all living within this highly individualized thing that I tried to capture. So, um, so yeah, your question is what can we do to I mean, we, we, we all have to be working very hard to make sure our attention <laughs> is a thick muscle, that we are developing our ability to be deeply attentive human beings. Simone Weil describes the most generous gift we can give to another person is attention. And unfortunately, it's the very thing that's under attack. Our attention span, the ability to, to you know, link thought and stay connected to that which is in front of us, the other that's in front of us. And so finding contemplative methods of doing so, I mean, even studying intensely as, as you're all doing, that is, that is a means of, of developing the capacity to stay with something long enough for it to become a part of you and to stay with others in a conversation long enough for that person and their way of th seeing, feeling, and, and being in the world to becomes a part of you. And so I, I think protecting that, developing daily practices for your own mind and also your relationship, think of it as muscles in, in many ways. I, I think that's, that's one way I, I would come to that. I wonder if anyone has any um, questions, comments they would like to um, bring to David. Yes, I see a, a hand there. Good. I'll just wait for the microphone. Is it on? Yes. What a wonderful talk. Thank you. We're going to be reflecting on this for a long time. I'm just thinking about groups. <laughs> and I'd like to challenge this notion of the cafe culture because uh, groups of people met in that cafe mm -hmm. in 1904 or whenever in. Uh, artists met, thinkers, and families or churches met as well. Mm -hmm. But are there ways in which we need to draw strength from the idea that the, the digital age brings together groups of people so we're not just single people going mad on our own? Yeah. But let's take chess. I can play chess in a group of people who are in Buenos Aires and Shanghai. Do you get my drift? I do, I do. And, and I thank you, excellent question. 
I should clarify, because as I, as I read the cafe culture thing, I get protective of the French cafe as well, because I've actually had some wonderful, I mean, that's where I had my conversation with Chris Seba. It's a wonderful French cafe. Um, what Levinas is speaking to in particular is, I don't know how many of you have been to a French cafe where you actually see the seats are there facing outward. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. And it's a spectator type thing. You're sitting there as a Gaijian subject with your cigarette and a drink, and no one can lay claim to you because you're just sitting there freely being. But you're taking the whole world in. You have a waiter who has a role, and that role is to meet your needs. It's all sort of pre-built. Their needs are irrelevant to you, right? So it's this fabricated world where all of that's sort of set. You're engaging in a spectator type situation. So he was speaking much more to that, that, that place where in many ways the, the interpersonal rules of the universe get suspended so that you can sit there and freely, just leisurely, and engage in the Gaijian invisibility type thing. So, you know, the fact that Simone de Beauvoir um, and Sartre, you know, sat at the cafes together and, and built incredibly important philosophical system, that, that he would not challenge. It's, it's the spectator piece more than anything else. Yeah. Um, and I do think in as much as <coughs> online is a place for fascination and gorging and spectator type things where I'm just getting to watch and take the world in passively, that's a very, very dangerous phenomenon. Whereas if it is a place for me to make new friends and link with people with shared interests, there's, there's a lot of potential there. There's a lot of wonderful things. As long as, and each person's gonna be different on this, as long as the tipping points of it now becoming um, a, an isolating sphere or I'm only living through those types of, of spaces that, that we don't get too far into there. Again, the candy bar, that can't be your primary diet. Thank you for such a seductive and, uh, and a very engaging talk. I was fascinated by the link to politics. Donald Trump garnered 81% of the evangelical vote, which is very intriguing in terms of this question of a libidinal community. Over the last 60 or 70 years, we can trace a kind of hyper-masculization of Christian men in the United States. So here you have a community anchored in religion over time, and yet influenced by American media images, from political heroes to film heroes, Theodore Roosevelt and the Rough Riders, up to John Wayne, up to the orange one. <laughs> what do you make of this relationship between the broader media environment impacting what should be a libidinal, a libidinal uh, anchored elemental community, sub-community within the context of a liberal political society. I wanna make sure I understood that entirely, but I mean, the very job of, of the media is to find ways to capitalize on how our how our attention works. So the, the sensational is the place where fascination, that, that's the attractor, that's the magnetic key, if you will. And so I think um, the media has been, a, in many ways, is, is quite brilliant at finding ways to sell to us versions of, sens of sensationalism. And, and I, I dare I say, and I know it quite well and quite intimately, the, the evangelical community is, is deep within a sensationalized, um, you know, from, from John, Jonathan Edwards, uh, in the Great Awakening all the way through contemporary evangelical type things, there, there's a type of emotivism that is very powerful, and within that is this vital elemental thing that, that is v that's very strong. Um, and so the media has known how to capitalize on that, and these have become sort of a reciprocating, you know, way of, 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 of turning people's heads. Go ahead. Did you have another? Uh, Susan Brennan. Yes, yes. Uh, and he was even much more moderate. Uh, than, than many of the others. So uh, unfortunately, I mean, figuring out the key to have people feel fascinated, right, and, and get attracted. I mean, I often think, as oftentimes when I'm looking at politics, in the United States at least, it sometimes feels like it's not even about the issues anymore. It's about the sensationalized, like it is about the controversy, it's about people actually wanting there to be drama. 
wanting there to be a fight, wanting there to be some type of blood sport to see, and so pitting things so strongly against each other guarantees, I mean, this polarization, it, it is vicious every day. And, and I, I, part of me thinks this is how we are connecting up to the wattage, right? This is part of, we, we are seeking the, 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 the libidinal flow that is a part of this spectacular, terrifying thing we're witnessing. Uh, you, you would think within democracy, you get, to, you get to witness the most civilized, but in actuality, part of the risk of the hyper-civilized is you are burying the fact that we're not especially civilized. I, sometimes when I'm challenged around, well, but human rights and, and all, it's very important, which I don't disagree with at all. I mean, I actually really do believe it, it's, it's critical that there is something that believes that we're more rational than what we are. You know, that, that there, we're not gonna ascribe to these abstract notions and somehow um, shelve the very fact that there is a deep, violent, complex, hungry part of our unconscious and our ways of being in the world. And our political systems actually have to account for that. It can't just be you know, that we, we all ascribe to a shared understanding of, of the human being. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure if that gets to some of what you're... Okay, great. Another question here. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, one thing that I'm particularly fascinated about is um, like digital identity and politics. And, and one thing, or I guess psychologists I can kind of refer to with this question is Brene Brown who studies vulnerability. Yeah. I'm curious what the idea of vulnerability would look like within like a digital medium, what that would look like to be vulnerable and sort of more elemental in the way that we engage with social media when it is kind of very difficult and sort of prescribed to kind of hide those kind of aspects. And to add another layer to that question, um, with regards to algorithmic biases and the way that kind of technology has been structured to kind of focus on this sensationalism, um, what does it look like for us to engage in that as well and to sort of challenge that? Or is there really kind of no way for us to kind of take that away um, and should we hold people like businesses or even government accountable to regulate the way that like algorithmic biases and sensationalism is used um, in social media as ways to kind of influence us? Hmm. Excellent questions, very hard questions. Um, yeah, and uh, Brene Brown, I, I find her interesting because here you have this big critique that you know, vulnerability is something that we don't know how to do, right? And the neoliberal subject's not allowed it. And so it's always interesting when there's a New York Times bestseller and now she has her own Netflix special and everything, right? Her whole thing is about taking off the armor and being, being able to be vulnerable with each other. And so you, you see these, these uh, she's been so taken up partly because we're all so cinched up and armored, right? Um, so I think she's, she's an interesting voice in this. Um, and her popularity, I'm still sort of analyzing what, what that means about, about things. But I, you probably are aware of some of the movements that have people taking pictures of themselves while they're crying or videos of themselves while they're crying when they so they don't look good. So they're not presenting via social media always this perfect manicured airbrush version of themselves. And that like this is a way of, of showing vulnerability. I'm not just posting on a bad day, I'm posting in a cataclysmic moment where I look really ugly while I'm crying, right? Like I know th these are attempts. Um, and I, I honestly don't know what to suggest beyond. I, I think these are, we're, people are flirting with doing this in, in these different ways, but I, I, I honestly don't have a lot of guidance on that. Um, I should have come with more of the uplifting and constructive pieces, but I, I'm not sure. I, I think we're trying to figure that out now. And as to the how and who we would hold accountable for the shaping of our cognitions and our, our seeking of sensationalism and the overdoing of things such that we all sort of go for the candy bar. Um, who holds what accountable? I mean, at, at this point, these social media platforms are, are far more powerful than most you know, governments. And, and you, know, you have Google that gets um, fined for various things it's doing in Europe and so forth. Like, there are these attempts to, to slap wrists and to re-regulate, but it's very hard to know, you know, if part of the problem is if the public wants it, then someone's gonna sell it to them. And so even if it changes its name from Facebook to Meta, or then you know, in 15 years from now, it's something completely different. There will always be someone wanting to sell into the marketplace if we are, I mean, this is true all the way back to Roman times in the Colosseum, right? We, 
we do, there were full coliseums to watch these terrible things happening. We are these fascinated beings. And uh, unfortunately now we have platforms that can magnify that by, by the many fold. And I don't know how you hold accountable. We as beings need to transform our communal desire sets so that we don't go seeking that stuff so that, so that we're not as hungry for the candy bar. I mean, if, if we are actually well nourished, this, my wife tells me this all the time, I eat healthy much of the time, unhealthy food actually is less attractive. And this is something I've found, it's true. Like if I eat healthy, when I actually eat something that's really sugary and salty, it doesn't taste nearly as good. Now when I'm not eating healthy, it's sort of amazing how that doesn't even register. And so I do think there's something about each of us eating nourishing things. And by that I mean close friendships, intimate relationships that, that we're really investing in, that contemplative stuff. It makes it so that it's gonna be much harder for me to wanna sort of doom scroll all the time on my phone because that's too salty, that's too sugary, and I'm gonna gain a lot of weight. Thank you. I mean, it is, it is interesting, isn't it, that the, who is responsible for the algorithm that takes you deeper and deeper and deeper down the rag, rabbit hole that you, that you wrote, wanted to go into. It's almost as if the, you know, the algorithm knows you want that sense of connection, so it'll give yeah. it to you, but it'll give it to you by closing you off and not even letting you know what you're being closed off from or what other people are seeing and, and so on. And um, maybe that is something we need to have a, a political discourse about who's going to be responsible for that, but yeah. it's hard to have. Paul. <coughs> so you, you used the word contemplative more than once and you didn't seem to be using it in quite the same way. So I'm just under s trying to get a sense of, you seem to use it as a, an honorific to some extent and then I'm curious as to what is resonating in your mind when you use that term. Contemplative, is that right? Con contemplation or contemplative. Yeah. That, that's helpful, thank you. I, it's true, I didn't, I didn't spend much time sort of thickening that. Um, you know, as Kevin Hart describes it, it's very specific to certain types of religious traditions um, and their contemplative practices, which by the way, the, the, the group he was studying, they wouldn't allow their monks to engage in the contemplative for longer than 20 minutes at a time. And I was shocked at that. And part of the reason was there was a concern that that then, that state would become its own type of idol, like that we then, would, would possess and lay claim to that as being the proper mental state when, when in actuality this, it's meant to be an exercise that, that helps transform the mind and to make the mind more available to experience. Not to consume experience, not to want experience, but rather to be more open and available to that which is, is being brought to someone in life. So hearing the whisper <laughs> in, in uh, the cave, um, you know, being open to what God would want me to see, to signs, and it's a, it's a much quieter mind that is just sort of available is the best word I would have for it. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that's, that's, when I've broadened out my understanding of contemplation, it's more uh, a, a mind that is available and not grasping. Levinas talks about the difference between grasping and caressing. And for him, grasping is what the constituting ego does as it's shaping the world outside itself and staying impervious. Whereas caressing is much more of an intersubjective. It's, it's me, it's the world, it's mutually shaping, mutually vulnerable. And the contemplative mind is, is one that caresses rather than grasps. Thank you. Question here, thank you. Yeah, hi, really interesting, uh, particularly on the sort of the, the, the political thrust of where you feel <coughs> this is all going. You counterbalance liberalism, which I take that you were using as a sort of way to describe Western democracy. Um, and then you talked about a future which seems to imply a natural progression towards a kind of neo-fascist state. And obviously you're using liberalism to experience fascism in the sense of the sort of mid-20th century fascism. Is it, is it your sort of conjecture that we will inevitably progress to a more fascistic type society and if so is that going to be a society which is so as violent as we saw or is it a society which is merely populist in the kind of way that you might refer to a Trumpian America as populist? <coughs> Don't have the crystal ball. Um, 
that said, I mean, I, I, do, I do very much fear that liberalism is on a march again into the hands of the populist, nationalist, neo-fascist shapes that are enticing it. Um, I mean, I see it in, in the United States, unfortunately, right in front of me. Uh, we hear of it across the world, you know, the rising authoritarianism and a lot of that, the, the neo-fascist elements involved in it. But I don't think it's an inevitable march. This is actually part of what I think Levinas is trying to do, is to say, let's stop this and say, and help us build the liberal democracy that actually takes seriously the elemental. Like we have to develop a different system so we don't keep repeating cycle of marching back into the hands of the fascist mentality. Um, so let's take what fascism is actually doing very well, which is staying close to blood, close to the body's need in the world, close to our precarity as, as beings, recognizing that and bringing that into the liberal system as opposed to you know, all of us ascribing to a human rights declaration, which by the way, it's, but I, I was thinking about this on the way over here today. I think of the, those, those declarations as wedding vows. Mm -hmm. So important, beautiful way of, of starting it. But what is marriage? It's absolutely every day of laying claim to the specific needs that are in front of me of this person with whom I've made this declaration. The vows will not be the thing to keep us together at all. It's the visceral needs of the person with whom I'm doing this. And I think oftentimes liberal democracy uh, believes that you know we the people have come up with this together and we've all agreed to do this together as though that's gonna have us marry each other every day, <laughs> which we will not. Um, it just, it gives way and we can't let it keep giving way. Um, we have to renew our vows every single day, every moment. Um, but I don't, to the last part of your question, whether it will become as violent, and I, I'm not sure. I hope not. I really hope not. Yeah. Well, David, thank you for a really um, thought-provoking, not exactly uplifting, but, but, but a talk that did get, get to, to, to the kinds of, of, of deep concentration that I hope um, a place like this can, can encourage us to have and, and, and trying to meld together ideas. Thank you very much, um, Michael and Pierce, for, for suggesting that Professor Goodman come to speak to us. You're right. It was a wonderful talk. And thank you very much thank thank for you. sharing with us. Thank, thank you, Helen. Appreciate it. Thank you all for being here. Um, on Friday at half past five, we have a, um, a slightly unusual um, event, uh, which is a, a family musical um, contemplation, stroke con concert, um, from the fa family of David Maxwell Fife, who was one of the people who prosecuted in the Nuremberg trials and mm -hmm. also um, helped draft uh, the uh, European Convention on Human Rights. Um, and it will be about some of the human stories that led to the drafting of that uh, convention. It will be something very different from what we've had before. Do please come along, share with your friends. Um, but otherwise, thank you all very much for coming and for your um, thoughtful and wonderful questions too. Thank you. Thank you.